Well, just on behalf of the crew, we'd like to uh, take this opportunity while we're all together and all awake at one time to say thank you to the thousands of people who made this flight possible. It started at KSC when they made the historic uh, turnaround in, in record-breaking time. And then the flight itself, which uh, has just been flawless. Columbia has performed absolutely flawless, flawlessly for us. It, uh, days have gone by without having to do an airlock reset, which is our way of saying there just have been no problems whatsoever. Uh, the people at Mission Control have been looking over our shoulder, coming up the, with the daily plan. And uh, we were talking yesterday to them. It, that has been so smooth that we simply haven't had to talk to the ground a whole lot to Mission Control, uh, which makes it seem like there's nothing going on. What it really means is that the plan that they come up with every day, we execute it, and uh, we don't have a lot of questions or a lot of problems with it, so we can press forward. So overall, our, our, uh, our flavor for this flight is that it, uh, it has done what 83 had set out to do. We have completed our task about and we'll be ready to come home on Thursday. So now I'm, uh, we're more than happy to entertain any questions. Hi, this is Nedra Pickler from the Houston Chronicle. Um, anyone can jump in on this one, maybe you, Commander Hustle. Now that you, you're beginning flight day 15, can you talk about any problems that have come up with such a long mission? As NASA prepares for longer missions with the space station, talk about how you have been affected physically and mentally by being in space for two weeks. Well, over 16 days, the, uh, uh, physically, what you notice is that you do need to continue exercising. We have an ergometer, which allows us to exercise, and we try to get about 30 minutes per person per day. And uh, uh, we have learned already in the program that that's an important thing for astronauts to do. It really helps your readaptation to 1G when you come back home. And that's mirrored by what the Russians have learned. They put even more emphasis on exercise every day. I read that they were doing up to two hours per day on the bike, especially prior to... Uh, re-entering the Earth's atmosphere at the end of the mission. So that's, I think that's the one thing uh, you need to concentrate on. We know, it, we know that you can get dehydrated up here, so we try to pay attention to drinking enough liquids every day to make sure that we uh, keep the blood volume up. Um, over the long term, you lose uh, bone calcium and some other uh, long-term effects, which we really don't have to worry about so much on a 16-day on a flight. Uh, but one thing I have been happy about, uh, very happy about on this crew is we've all stayed healthy. We've had no colds. As you can imagine, being cooped up in a small space like this, if one person comes down with the flu or the cold or virus, it's quite possible for it to sweep among the whole crew, and we just have not had that. Everybody has stayed very, very healthy, and that has made this flight very pleasurable. Um, for Janice, can you talk about how you see this mission helping in future space exploration? The primary focus of this mission, of course, is to bring research results back for people to use on the ground. Some of those results can also be used in space. In particular, we have many experiments on this flight, the express rack, for example, that are targeted towards the International Space Station. We're using them this flight as a test bed to test some of these out early on as we're still building the hardware for space station. The combustion module that we just uh, are in the process of finishing up, we'll do the last runs on uh, today and tomorrow is a kind of space station experiment where you can change the hardware during the flight and would allow us to change the experiment as we go along in the evolution of space station. That's an example of things that are directly targeted towards space future programs, but most of this, 90% of the work up here, is targeted towards improving systems on Earth. Your flight is, is certainly very similar to what I think a lot of us can expect when space station operations begin in a few years. And it's certainly been as big a success, and it's right, in terms of goals accomplished as the Mars Pathfinder, for example. Uh, yet Pathfinder has certainly generated uh, much more public interest. And I'm, I'm curious if, if any of you would have any thoughts about, this. is that a problem for Space Station down the road? Is it difficult to sell the kind of science that you're going to be doing on the station versus uh, the high drama missions like a Mars Pathfinder or one of the planetary flights? No, I don't think so. I think in the short term, uh, things like the Mars Pathfinder, which are truly uh, great achievements, really spark the public interest, and that's really good for the space program in general. Uh, as we start building the space station, I think you'll see a lot of public interest. And then, as the science results start feeding back into society on Earth and really improving the quality of life, I think people will really come to appreciate just exactly what we're doing in space and what a fine investment in the future of the country and the world that it is. Just looking back at the at this flight, which has been obviously a, a major success, I guess, for you guys in terms of your 
of your goals. What is the significance of it long term? I realize you don't have results yet, but I'm thinking in terms of is this an incremental step forward in the kind of research you're doing? Are you making major steps forward? Um, how, would you, how would you describe the, the scientific significance of it? Thanks. The nature of research in general, not just in this program, but in all over the research programs everywhere, is an evolutionary process. You build on the research that came after you and you feed to the that came before you and you feed to the research that comes after you. And this flight is a perfect example of all those various ranges. The combustion experiments, by and large, on this flight are first-time flyers. We're doing very basic research that's never been done anywhere else before. Some of the experiments, like the protein crystal growth experiments, are one of a long series that started way back in the early days of the space program and built on ground-based research and continues to build on new ground-based research. We expect that to become a big player in future space programs, but it's in the middle of its evolution, and you can't point to this flight as being particularly significant. Some of the other experiments, are, like the space station ones we talked about earlier, are part of a design process. So there's a big range of things here, and I don't know that we'll be able to point to any single experiment and say this one was really a pathfinder. But I think you'll find that the suite of experiments we have on board as has been true of all the space flight missions in the past and, and hopefully in the future are all contributing good science and good results to help improve all those programs. So this evening we have uh, a little bit of what we've been doing over, over the day today, and then we'll follow it up with a couple of live Internet questions. Okay, we've already told you about ASCO PGBA, that it's a plant growth experiment. What we want to show you today is that, is, in fact, we do have some growth during the uh, last two weeks. Concentrate on the center top of the screen, uh, the large broadleaf plant there, and uh, see how it changes here as we flick over. There's about, uh, that's about 12 days worth of growth in space. You'll see some of the plants are bigger with some more leaves on it also. Uh, this plan is designed, or this experiment is designed, just to understand basic plant growth and how it differs in zero gravity. One of the major facilities that we have back in the Space Lab module is called the Express Rack. This is actually a piece of the International Space Station we'll be launching in a very short few months here. This rack is designed to accommodate mid-deck locker type experiments so that we'll be able to launch experiments in the shuttle in the mid-deck area and then transfer them over to the space station where they'll be mounted in the express rack to operate there. And uh, part of this mission, what we did on day two, was take an experiment that was mounted in the mid-deck for launch. We transferred it back to the space lab module, and uh, today we were transferring that back in the mid-deck to get ready for landing. We unbolted, we transferred through the tunnel, and here we're reinserting it down in the mid-deck, the locker position. We re-bolted in there, and we're ready to come home and power it on. Like I said, this is actually a piece of the space station we're flying today, and it uh, worked uh, just great. It was a superb way to start the space station era. This combustion module one experiment is also a precursor to space station operation, operational equipment. The idea here is that we have separate experiment uh, modules that can be inserted into the combustion chamber as necessary. Fortunately, on our, tr our uh, mission so far, we've been able to get so much done in the time available because of the great planning from the ground team that we're able to put this module back in and do some more experiments with it. It was already in the first half of the mission. This is a laminar soot processes experiment, and the purpose is to study soot formation. Uh, one question that comes up, we answered the essay, is what, where do we burn these little fires? And this is one of the combustion chambers in which we, we uh, light the little fires for study. Uh, there's a there's a, a end cap that goes over this, and then an, another panel also. So it's all sealed up very safely from the uh, cha the uh, module where we're working. And Philip McCloskey from Timbers, Michigan, wants to know what type of computers we fly on board. Well, the general purpose computers that actually control the shuttle and keep all the systems of the sh shuttle under control, the five AP101. We also carry two 386s and nine 486 sync pads and one Panasonic for the commander and pilot to practice approaches and landings. Richard from Albany, Georgia wants to know how we sleep and if it's comfortable. Well, this is a sleep station. We're taking you live inside one of the Space Shuttle Columbia sleep stations. We have sleeping bags. The compartment's not very large. This is Roger Crouch. He's uh, climbing in to go to sleep for the evening. 
He climbs into the sleeping bag, zips it up, he straps himself down both across his chest and across his head and closes the door. It's very quiet and dark inside. I find this very comfortable. I do not strap myself down. I float around inside all night. So sometimes it can be difficult finding the door in the morning because it's so dark in there. And here we are back on the flight deck, and I think this might be our final crew choice downlink for the mission, and we wanted to thank everybody and uh, thank especially all those people in mission control that have been with us all along for all these numbers of days, and we hope to uh, clean up, pack up, and bring home a healthy, clean, happy Space Shuttle Columbia. And that's all for tonight. Columbia Houston, we copy all, and I especially appreciate a very healthy Columbia. And also for the rest of the team, we appreciate all the great downlink you've given us. You've, we feel like we've been on board right with you. Thank you, Kay, and uh, have a good day, and we'll see you in a couple of days. Hello, this is Dan Golden. Who am I speaking to? Good morning, I think it is, Mr. Golden. Oh, good afternoon, sorry. Good afternoon, Mr. Golden. Panel Commander Janice Voss, Panel Specialist Roger Crouch, and Mission Specialist Mike Earnhardt. Uh, ready to talk to you. We're looking forward to it. Roger is upside down again, or is he right side up? It's all a matter of perspective, sir. Well, let me turn it over to the Senator. Uh, you're his constituent, and I think he'd like to talk to you. Roger, good to talk to you again. I'll tell you, it seems like yesterday that we were talking to the students at the John Sevier Middle, Middle School in Kingsport, and they were asking, asking uh, what it's like to be weightless, and looking at you upside down, uh, I'll have to ask that question once again for them. What's it feel like to be talking upside down? <laughs> well, it's uh, pretty awesome, actually. It's, uh, there's no perception of upside down. My brain right now, as I look down the length of the space lab thinks this is like a lighted aisle in a, in an airplane or something like that. So it's uh, it's just a matter of perspective, as I said earlier. It's, it's, but it's really a great feeling to be up here. It, I wish it, I could describe it so that it could people could relate to it. It's just incredible. Right. I need to do two things. I talked to, to your mother about 30 minutes ago uh, in Fentress County, and she said that she talked to you last week, but the, as you were flying over Africa, you went so fast she didn't get a chance to say, I love you, so I'm going to pass that on, and that she's counting the hours till you get back home. So I'm going to get that in real quick. Real quick. Well, I really appreciate that. And Mom's really been tracking this thing, so I'm sure she's keeping everybody straight back there in Tennessee. Oh, great, Roger. Listen, uh, I did also talk to one of the students that you and I talked uh, by video conferencing when you were in my office, and we talked back to Tennessee. And I called Terry Taylor, who is 13 years old in the eighth grade there, and uh, she says two questions. One question, as an astronaut in space, do you think we'll ever be able to live out in space and even on other planets? I'll let you answer that one first. Well, I think certainly we'll be able to live in, in space. It's incredible how the body can adapt. You as a doctor know that the doc, that the body is an incredible miracle almost every day, the way that it copes with things. And coming to space is not a problem. The only problem is the shock of going into and out of a, real, a severely different environment like 1G and low G. So, but when you're here, it's just, it's just a great feeling, a great place to be. Other planets, I think, will be the same issue, that there will be the travel to that planet where your body will acclimate to space and then or low gravity environment and then uh, acclimating to the G level on that planet will be a, a shock for the body, but the body will adapt to it quickly, I think. Well, that, that is great, and I'll, I, hopefully she's watching this right now, and I'll pass that on to her. She's going to be going to space camp in Huntsville later this month, and she asked me to ask you if you feel that this was a good learning experience for kids to learn what astronauts do, that is, going to space camp. I'm going to let Janice Voss answer that. She's familiar with the space camp. I think it's a great opportunity, but here's Janice. So I get that question a lot from the children that I talk to on the various public speaking things that we do. 
And I've never been to space camp itself because that program came into effect after I was past that time frame. But I have talked to many, many children and parents who have been through that program, some who have been through the program several times, and they all come back very excited and, to my mind, have a much better appreciation for what we do up here. It's a very well-run program, and it's, the kids that go through it get a lot out of it. Fortunately, they say that we need to terminate our conversation, but I'll tell you, Mike and Janice and Roger, it is a real privilege and a real pleasure for me as a scientist, as someone who admires so much what you're doing, to be able to talk to you directly. You're an inspiration for the country, an inspiration for students who are studying science, and an inspiration for all of us. Well, thank you very much, Senator, and I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to call us today. We know that you're a very interested person in education in the country, and one of the things that we're real interested in is contacting the children and getting them interested in science and education, and we think the space program has a real mission in that field. 